Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people. And thank you for all those who are serving us by grace and faith and faithfulness. We pray, Lord, you bless everyone in Jesus' name. As we come to the Bible study tonight, strengthen us, empower us, help us, Lord, to be doers of the word in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, as you open our eyes of understanding, we'll be stronger in the Lord in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome everyone to the Bible study once again tonight. We started a study of the gospel according to St. Mark a few weeks ago. And today we're coming to chapter 1, reading from verse 9 to verse 13. Mark chapter 1, verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In verse 12, And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Verse 13, And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Those are the verses we're looking at tonight. And the topic of our study tonight is Christ's glorious triumph. Christ's glorious triumph and our gracious victory over the tempter. Christ's glorious triumph. He overcame. He triumphed. He conquered. Although the devil came and brought temptation his way, but in the strength that the Spirit had given him, and with the power that he had got as he waited on the Father and he fasted and prayed, he was able to overcome. But not only that he overcame, he's passing that victory and that triumph unto us. That's why we're bringing in the believer the gracious victory over the tempter, even by the believer. So you have two sides to the message tonight, to the study tonight. Number one, the side of Christ. Number two, the side of the Christian. On the side of Christ, a glorious triumph, a glorious victory, and a glorious overcoming of the tempter and all his temptations. On the side of the Christian, the believer, the gracious victory we have through him and through connection with him and through the experience of the Christian life, we are able to have the victory as well. You'll have the victory in Jesus' name. Christ's glorious triumph and our gracious victory over the tempter. There are three things we're looking at as we look at this passage. Number one, God's trustworthy voice concerning his well-pleasing son. God's trustworthy voice concerning his well-pleasing son. You can see it in verse 13. There came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Point number two. The great triumphant victory of our worthy Savior. The great triumphant victory of our worthy Savior. Is our Savior, and is worthy to be our Savior. He came to save us from sin. If he were a sinner himself, he couldn't save us. If he were helpless himself, he couldn't help us. If he were hopeless also by himself, he couldn't help us who are hopeless. But he had the victory, he had the power, and because he triumphed, now he can help us and he can lift us up out of the dungeon in which any one of us might have fallen. The 
great triumphant victory of our worthy Savior. Point number three, the gracious transmitted virtue. We have grace in him. And we have grace through him. And he transmits that grace into our lives. And because he transmits the grace into our lives, that's why when temptation comes, we overcome. I say we overcome. And whatever direction the tempter or the temptress may be coming from, whatever their power and whatever their method and whatever the strategy Christ passes is virtue unto us and we are able to overcome. Point number three, the gracious transmitted virtue of well-placed saints. Well-placed saints were in him. And because we are well-placed in him through salvation, and through the grace that he imparts into our lives, we are able to also have the virtue that makes us to overcome the graciously transmitted virtue of well-placed saints. Let's come to number one, God's trustworthy voice concerning his well-beloved son that we find in verses 9, 10, and 11. Look at verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway, that means immediately, as he came out of that water of baptism, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Look at the same account, but the details, the more details given us in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then came Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. He was about to start his ministry. Now he was about 30 years of age on earth. And now to start the ministry, he went to John to be baptized. John was a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, the voice crying in the wilderness, and the one to introduce Christ unto the people, unto the nation. And so Christ came, and then we're told in verse 14, but John forbade him, saying, I have need of you to be baptized of thee. Comest thou to me? You must remember he had said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But there's one coming after me, greater than I, mighty than I, whose shoes lashed, I'm not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you of the Holy Ghost and with fire. And he knew that the baptism of Jesus Christ was superior and higher and greater and mightier than his own water baptism. That's why he said unto Jesus, I have need to be baptized of you. I'm only baptizing in water. The baptism the baptism you have is greater. The baptism you have is heavenly. The baptism you have is empowering. And the baptism you have is going to bring personal renewal and personal revival and personal fervency into my life. I have need to be baptized of you. And are you coming to me? What do I have? What am I doing? And what am I baptizing in? I only baptize in water. Do you come to me? Verse 15. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. Permit it to be so now. Allow it to go like this. For thus it becometh us, you and I. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. He said, John, you and I, we need to fulfill the will of God. And we need to perform the watch of God. John, you and I, we need to be faithful. And you need to be faithful in baptizing me in water. That will please the Father. And that will honor the Father. And that will fulfill the goal of the Father for which he has sent you to introduce me to the people. They 
therefore you must be faithful and fulfill all righteousness also on my side it is necessary that i fulfill all righteousness so it's not just jesus fulfilling all righteousness but of them both john and jesus both jesus and john that's why he said suffer each to be so now although you feel different or do you think it shouldn't be but let it be for thus it becometh us it befits us to fulfill all righteousness then he suffered him that means he permitted him then he let it go like that he said the will of the lord be done and so he baptized jesus in the water look at verse 16 and jesus when he was baptized went up straight way out of the water look at that language out of the water that tells us something the baptism is not by sprinkling water on the head of jesus and the baptism is not by pouring water on the head of jesus he actually went down into the river he actually was immersed in the river he was deep in the river and after dipping him in the river because you know baptism signifies burial were buried the past and then the new life rises that's why it says after he was baptized he had gone into the river deep into the river immersed in the river submerged by the water totally he now came out of the water and lo the heavens opened unto him every time you obey the lord the heavens open every time you let go and let god the heavens open every time you don't see i'm greater than this i'm higher than this how can i go to john to baptize in water i am higher than him i'm greater than him and the baptism i offer is greater than his own baptism so do i need to go to him yes jesus went to him in submission to the father he made himself a servant and he made himself just like us and as was coming out of the water in the heavens opened and then we're told he saw the spirit of god descending like a dove and lightning upon him a greater blessing comes after obedience and even though other people might say you don't need that you don't need to be baptized in water where you fulfill the righteousness and what the lord himself had stipulated and commanded and, and uh, prescribed then the blessings come and lo in verse 17 and lo a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son he said this is my beloved son he, the introduction was not just from john the introduction is from the father in heaven this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased is perfect and well pleased in him is sinless and well pleased in him is spotless and well pleased in him is obedient to me in every detail and well pleased in him in private in public and physically and spiritually is obedient and faithful and i'm so well pleased in him and the voice came from heaven to introduce the lord jesus christ as the very son of god the voice of god the voice of god that came from heaven that's my beloved son this is my beloved son i am well pleased in him look at deuteronomy chapter 4 Deuteronomy chapter 4, I read from verse 35. Deuteronomy chapter 4, reading from verse 35. Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest, mightest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. Verse 36, out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice he had done that in the old testament and now in revealing christ his only begotten son so you will not have any doubt in your heart as to the identity of jesus as to the personality of jesus as to the acceptance of jesus as to the exaltation of jesus so you will not have any doubt in your mind a voice came from heaven this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased and here we're told in verse 36 out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice that he might instruct thee 
that she might instruct thee in saying something by accepting Jesus, by affirming Jesus, and by confirming Jesus that this is my beloved son. And the voice came from heaven. It is so that he might instruct thee as to who Jesus is, as to what Jesus will do, as to the authority of Jesus, as the confirmation of Jesus, as the one that has come to do his perfect will on earth. You had that voice because he wanted to instruct thee. And upon earth he showed thee his great fire. And had thou heardest his words out of the midst of the fire. Let's come to Matthew chapter 17. And we're looking at the affirmation, the confirmation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that God in heaven spoke about him. And God in heaven revealed him and said, This is my beloved Son. Matthew chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. And then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. It's a representation of heaven. And it is what he was already he was thinking of. We're going to see when we get to heaven. When we get to heaven, we'll see Jesus glorified. We'll see Moses as well. And we'll see Elijah and see the prophets. And Moses represented the people under the law. And uh, Elijah represented the people that will go up in the rapture. The Old Testament assembly and the New Testament assembly coming together, represented by Moses and by Elijah and now Peter said it's wonderful to be here it's good for us to be here and he says if this is what you'll permit us to do if thou wilt let us make us three tabernacles one for thee the Lord Jesus and one for Moses representing the old covenant people and then one for Elias representing Hannah, believers that will not see death but the rapture while he yet spake, behold, he brought a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud. A voice out of the cloud is a trustworthy voice. Is the voice testifying concerning you know, the very Son of God? Is God some mystical voice? A voice out of the cloud which said, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But now he goes beyond and he says, hear ye him. He's going to talk to you. Hear ye him. He's going to teach you. Hear ye him. He's going to instruct you. Hear ye him. He's going to make revelations unto you concerning you know, things you knew before. He'll bring a new interpretation, a better interpretation, higher interpretation. Hear ye him. He's going to tell you things you have never heard that he, I gave him to tell you for your ultimate salvation. Hear ye him. He's going to tell you and show you and instruct you by the Spirit. Hear ye him. He will talk about the lively doctrine that will change your life, that will transform your life. He'll talk to you about what he has got from me and got from heaven. This is my beloved son. His voice is higher than that of any prophet. His voice is higher than that of any philosopher. His voice is greater and higher than anyone you'll ever hear. Hear ye him. you see God, his trustworthy voice confirming his well pleased seen a son. A later as uh, Peter wrote uh, in the epistle uh, to the people of God, he brought the remembrance of this experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. Brought it back again in Second Peter chapter 1 verse 16. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. He said, we were there, we saw him, transfigured were there 
We saw the Holy Ghost upon him over there. We saw the cloud. We were over there. We heard the voice of the Almighty God speaking from heaven. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. When they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, when we saw him transfigured, we saw his glory, we saw his majesty, and we saw his exaltation. I was there. I was an eyewitness. And John and James were there. We were eyewitnesses. Verse 17, and he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice unto him from excellent glory, there came the voice of the Father unto him from excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Before Jesus came to this world, the prophets had prophesied about him. And the prophets had shown who he will be and how he will be exalted. Come to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42, I'm reading now from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 42, reading from verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delighteth. This talking about Christ. He had not come, he had not been born into the world, but the expectation was there because Isaiah had been talking about him earlier. Isaiah had revealed about him, about the Lord Jesus Christ earlier. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. He's talking about Christ. Isaiah saw Christ even before he came. That is, he saw him in revelation. He saw him in prophecy. And he said, the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his kingdom and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish Establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. That's why he's now revealing to us in chapter 42 of Isaiah, reading from verse 1, it says, In whom my soul delighted, I have put my spirit upon him. And he shall bring forth judgment unto the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. He bruised reed, verse 3, shall he not break, and the smoking flies shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have said, judgment justice in the earth and the earth shall wait for his law that was prophesied about jesus christ and we see the fulfillment in matthew chapter 12 is the, is the one the heavenly father delights in is the one that is well pleasing unto the Father. Matthew chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 18. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 18, it says, Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen. This is what we are reading in Isaiah. This is a fulfillment now on the Lord Jesus Christ, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. So it's what it wasn't just once. That the heavenly father said and we're pleased in him he was a well pleasing son he says it's my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased and i will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the gentiles he shall not strive nor cry neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets a bruised reed shall he not break and smoking flax shall he not quench till he sent forth judgment unto victory and in his name 
shall the Gentiles trust. In his name shall the Gentiles trust. That's why the voice came from heaven, so that you will know this is he. And the Father is well pleased in him, so that you will put your confidence in him, and put your trust in him, and put your faith in him, because it's him and him alone that the Father has approved, and appointed, and anointed, and commissioned to be our Savior. In John chapter 8, why did the Father say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Look at the pleasing life of Christ. John chapter 8, reading from verse 28. In John chapter 8, verse 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, no other one. I am he, the beloved son. I am he, the great savior. I am he, our sanctifier. I am he, is the baptizer, the Holy Ghost. I am he, is a redeemer, deliverer, and healer. I am he, through him and through him alone, salvation comes, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my father has taught me, I speak these things I do not think of myself and as my father has taught me as my father has instructed me I speak these things and he that sent me is with me the father has not left me alone listen to this for I do always those things that please him I do always those things that please him. That's why the voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, reading from verse 28. John chapter 12, reading from verse 28. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven. Do you see the voice always coming, always coming as an approver for the Son, as an affirmation of the Son? Do you see that this is a confirmation over and over and over that Jesus Christ is the beloved Son of God? Then came a voice from heaven saying, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. And the people therefore that stood by and heard it said it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me but for your sakes. This voice came, I already have assurance. I already know that I'm the beloved son of the Father. It came for you so that you will know that the Father accepts me, approves of me, affirms me, so that you'll put your trust in me. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, shall draw all men unto me. The voice has come that Jesus Christ pleased the Father. Jesus Christ did not please himself. He pleased the Father. Romans chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 3. Romans chapter 15, from verse 3. In Romans chapter 15, verse 3, For even Christ pleased not himself. Even Christ pleased not himself. His goal, his will, his heart, his might, his purpose, his pursuit, his dedication was to please the Heavenly Father. And he carried that out. For Jesus Christ pleased not himself. And because of that, he now, through the, the Father, now through him, speaks to us. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners speak in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. 
is uh, giving us uh, someone higher than the angels, higher than the high priests of the Old Testament, higher than the prophets of the Old Testament, much, much higher than John the Baptist. And now the Father speaks unto us by his Son. And he says, this is my beloved Son, hear ye him. And then he goes on to say, by whom he has appointed, hear of all things, by whom also he has made the walls who be in the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power upholding all things, upholding the whole universe, upholding everyone in the universe, upholding the saints and upholding the believers by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, be made so much better, so much higher, so much greater than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than and day for unto which of the angels said he at any time thou art my son unto which of the angels said he at any time thou art my son is greater than all those angels and you cannot say jesus was just an angel no it's, it's not it's greater than that or jesus was just a prophet it's greater than that thou art my son this day have i begotten thee and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. What's the purpose of all this? Why is it that now he has said, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased? Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 22. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Verse 22. For Moses truly said unto, unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things. Him, Christ, him, Jesus, him, a Savior, Redeemer, him, a Sanctifier, Teacher, him, our healer, deliverer, him, the very Son of God who died for us on the cross of Calvary, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul on earth, it shall come to pass that every soul in the whole universe, it shall come to pass that every soul in every country, every soul everywhere, which shall not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. That's Jesus Christ who is our Savior. He's so important in your life and in every life. Look at verse 26. Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquity turning away everyone from his iniquity we're coming to mark chapter one mark chapter one we we'll look at verses 12 and 13 now mark chapter one verses 12 and 13 the great triumphant victory of our worthy savior of the worthy son of god of the worthy sanctifier of the worthy perfect sacrifice he could sacrifice for us because he had no sin he was sinless temptation came but he overcame look at mark chapter 1 verses 12 and 13 and immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted of satan not tempted of god tempted of satan not tempted by the holy ghost tempted of satan and it was with the wild bees and the angels ministered unto him once again let's see a fuller uh, recollection a fuller write-up on that temptation matthew chapter 4 reading from verse 1 Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 1. Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted 
of the devil. Again, it's assuring us temptation is not coming from God. It's not coming from the Father. It's not coming from an angel. It's not coming from the Holy Ghost. It's coming from Satan. It's coming from the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And that means no food and nothing. He didn't take anything. Look at this. It says he was up to watch and hunger. He was now hungry after 40 days of fasting. And here are the details of the temptation. Verse 3, and when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And what's Satan doing here? And what's the devil suggesting here? The Father had already said, This is my beloved Son. And Satan was saying, Do you really believe that? Do you really accept that? And you, can you really affirm that, okay, if you are the son of God, do something to convince me. The devil might come to you and bring temptation like that. His watch has come out. His watch is plain. His watch is clear. And the promise he has given you and the affirmation he has made concerning you is very clear. And then the devil will say, if that is really true. If that is really a fact, then do this. You will not obey Satan. I said, you will not obey Satan. He said, command these stones and uh, make them bread for you to eat. But he answered, it is written. That's how to overcome. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. How do you overcome temptation? The same way Jesus overcame temptation because he knew the reaching word. He believed the reaching word. He stood on the reaching word. He quoted the reaching word. He knew the finality of the reaching word. And because of that, he said, it is reaching. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He's telling us that the word of God is greater than ordinary food. The word of God that feeds your soul, the word of God that builds your faith, the word of God that gives you strength, the word of God that gives you power is higher and greater than any material sin. And if you have that concept that this word of God is greater than food, greater than material possession, greater than money, greater than job, greater than anything you can have here on earth, you will always overcome. You'll be an overcomer. Verse 5, then the devil taketh him into an high mountain and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the son of God. That was uh, Satan's problem. That was Satan's uh, bone of contention. The father had said, this is my beloved son. You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to always contradict the word of God. You have heard the word of God. You have heard the pronouncement coming from heaven and Satan wants to shift you away from that. Everybody had heard, John heard, the people who were there at the baptism of Jesus, they were there and Jesus also heard, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased as the Lord has affirmed his position and in authority. The devil now said, if thou be the son of God, the Lord might promote you, and the Lord might give you an affirmation, and he might give you an approval. He has given you this opportunity, he has given you on this position, and he has affirmed it. And the devil will always want to challenge that, will always want to challenge you, okay, if you are the son of God, if you are a child of God, if you are a saint of God, if you are a real believer, and if you are a real minister, why don't you do this? Don't answer the devil. If you're going to answer at all, you answer by the word of God. I said you answer by the word of God. Verse 6 again, and he says unto him, if, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. 
cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. The temptation here, okay, you are saying it is written, it is written. The devil knows some scriptures too, but he will twist the scripture. He will misinterpret the scripture. He will misplace the scripture so as to make you do something you know, that is not acceptable unto God. He said, okay, it is written also. He shall give the singers charge over you and he'll pick you up. You'll not dash your foot against a stone. But thank God our Savior is always an overcomer. Our Redeemer is always a conqueror. And from whatever direction Satan came from, Jesus always overcame. And if we are following Jesus, we'll always overcome. I said, I will always overcome. Look at verse 7. Jesus said unto him, it is written again. I learned something from here, from that place. Even though the devil has taken out the word of God, and the devil said, it is written that your enemy is coaching the word, should not take the word away from your mouth. That Satan is coaching the word, should not take the word away from your mouth. That Satan is misinterpreting the Bible, and mis uh, misplacing the Bible, and is saying it is written. You know, in the word of God, show that this and this, that should not take the word of God away from you. That is your strength. That is your power. That is the platform you are standing on. That's the foundation you are standing on. Once the word of God is taken away from you, there's no victory again. But thank God you will have the victory. Look at verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Look at verse 8 again. The devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Understand? You overcame the first time. That doesn't mean the devil will not be tired. And then you have overcome the second time. Time, that doesn't mean the devil will be tired. He has brought this kind of temptation and you flawed him. He has brought another kind of temptation and you give him a spiritual knockout and knockdown. He's not giving up. He'll bring another kind of temptation. But the same way you overcame number one, you'll overcome number two. The same way you overcame number two, you'll overcome number three. And the same way you overcame yesterday, you'll overcome today in Jesus' name. The devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and says unto him, all these will I give thee. He has dropped, if thou be the Son of God. There's no way there now because Jesus knows the Son of God. And Jesus affirmed it is written. Now he comes from another direction. He says, now, you want to go to the cross and die. That's the method of the Father. That's the way of the Father. But you know what? You don't have to go to the cross. I can make a deal with you here, and all these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. If thou will watch, uh, fall down and worship me, all you have to do is forsake your father. All you have to do is forsake the cross. All you have to do is forsake being the final sacrifice, the lamp of God that takes away the sin of the world, and I will give you the kingdom. It's not just about reigning. It's about saving people. It's about cleansing people. It's about preparing people for heaven. It's not just about possessing the kingdoms of the world. It's about obeying the Father and shedding His blood for the remission of our sins so that He can cleanse us and wash us and forgive us and save us and prepare us for heaven. It goes beyond just having the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus didn't come to possess the kingdoms of the world. He came to raise up His bride. He came to cleanse the people that were trusting him. He came to prepare them for heaven. In verse 10, then Jesus said, get thee and Satan, for it is written. Have you noticed how Jesus overcame? 
always throughout the world, it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Verse 11, Then the devil leaveth him, he will leave you. Once you say no to him, he will leave you. And you say no the second time, he will not stay around. And then you say no finally. And you say, I know my ground. I know where I stand. I know who I am. And I know that I have the victory over you. He will be under your feet. He will leave you. Then the devil leaveth him. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. I, I want to ask you, uh, the, the words that Jesus quoted and said, it is written the first time, second time it is written, and the third time it is written. Where did he get that? Where was that written? Let's come to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And see the words that Jesus quoted to Satan. This word is mighty and powerful. All the words of the Old Testament, they're mighty and powerful. And the words of the New Testament, of a higher covenant, of the New Covenant, they're mighty and powerful. And every word you quote, the devil will make him run away from you in Jesus' name. Look at, uh, look at this, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. He humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know look at this that man does not live by bread only but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the lord does man live that's what he quoted and it was effective when you quote that word it will be effective Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, I read from verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 6, reading from verse 16. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God. That's the word he quoted against Satan. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and serve him and serve him and shall swear by his name. And when you honor the word of God like that, when you exalt the word of God like that, you'll always have the victory. I'm talking to victorious people there. Look at Job chapter 23, and I'm reading from verse 12. Job chapter 23, we're reading from verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his leaves. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. What does that mean? It means that the way you have victory is this, that you put the watch of God as number one, as a priority of your life, as the scene of preeminence in your life. And you exalt that word, and you lift up that word, and you honor that word, and you appreciate that word above your necessary food. What does that mean, necessary food? The things that will provide your necessary food, money, certificate, education, work, strenuous things, and all the provisions of the world that will give you food eventually, you exalt the word of God. Food for the body is all right, but then you need victory in your soul, and you need victory in your heart. And esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Look at Psalm 119, Psalm 119. How do we overcome? We overcome by the word. Overcome temptation, overcome the tempter, overcome the temptress, overcome anything that wants to shift us away from the path of righteousness and from pleasing the Father. In uh, Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 9. Where with thou shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to thy word? That's the source of victory. That's the secret of victory. 
That's the power for victory. It says, how can a young man or a young woman, an old man, an old woman, a believer, young or old, how can he cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. When you seek the Lord with all your heart, and you're appreciating with all your heart, and you're not giving part of your heart to the things of this world, but all your heart you give unto the Lord to follow the Lord. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments, thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. The words you are hearing. The teachings you are hearing, all these verses you are learning, and the Bible passages you are learning from, it says, You hide that in your heart, thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Look at Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 16. In Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, it says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. I chewed them, I swallowed them, I digested them. They became part of my system, and they mixed with my veins, and with my brain, and with my blood, and with my thoughts, and with my mind. I swallowed them. I took the word of God, and I put everything inside me. That's how to have the victory. You are saturated with the word. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Thy words... Thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Is the word. And when uh, we come to the church, this is uh, the reason why we're being fed with the word. It is food for the soul. It is food for the spirit. It is food that will give us strength. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. I'll give you pastors, I'll give you preachers, I'll give you teachers, and, and, and they will feed you with knowledge and with understanding. And as you take in that word, as you believe that word, as you accept that word, and as you meditate on that word, as you remember that word, when temptation comes, you have the victory. I said you have the victory. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23, and I'm reading here from verse 4. Jeremiah 23, verse 4. And I will set up shepherds over them, I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more. Those who fear the devil, they have not been well fed, and those who fear the circumstances of life, they have not been well fed. Those who fear men or women, they have not been well fed. Those who fear uh, demons or evil spirits, they have not been well fed. But the Lord said, I'm going to give you shepherds, and he, they shall feed you, and they shall feed you so in such a way that you will fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. You will not be lacking. I said you will not be lacking. Everything you need to be an overcomer, everything you need to be a victorious person, he will give unto you in Jesus' name. Did Jesus overcome? I said, did Jesus overcome? Oh yes, he overcame. He had no sin at all. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 17. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself had suffered, being tempted, is able to succor them, able to support them, able to lift them up, able to encourage them that are tempted also. is overcome, he'll make you an overcomer. Look at chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 15. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we have not an high priest 
which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Christ, our Savior, and Christ, the forerunner of our faith, Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, he was tempted in all points, just like us we are, yet without sin. He'll give you the victory. Look at verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find help in time of need. You'll find help. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him because he overcame and because he, he drove away the devil and he overcame the devil it says because of that he's able to save us to the uttermost as we come to God by him seeing he ever leave it to make intercession for them for such an high priest became us who is holy harmless undefiled separate from sinners and made higher than the heaven sinless he was able to sacrifice that holy life unto God for us. First Peter chapter 1 verse 18. First Peter chapter 1 verse 18. For as much as she know that she were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. The lamb without blemish, without spot. He was tempted, but he never sinned. First John chapter 3, verse 5. First John chapter 3, verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. In him is no sin. He lived a sinless life, a spotless life, a blameless life, a perfect life. And because of that, a sacrifice for you, for me, a sacrifice for the world was accepted of the Father. Let's come to point three now. We're coming to Mark chapter one. Mark chapter one, verses nine to thirteen. The graciously transmitted virtue of well-placed saints. Let's come to chapter 1 of Mark. I'm reading from verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth unto Galilee. Nazareth of Galilee. And was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water... He saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan. And he was of the wild beasts, and angels ministered unto him. What we're doing here now is to look at what was said about the Son. And look at what is said about us, the sons and the daughters of God. And compare and see that as he had the victory, we too will have the victory. I have the victory. Number one, number one, look at verse, uh, in verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. He was and he is still the son of God, and we are sons of God. We are sons of God. John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 12. John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 12. It says, 
in verse 12 and uh, but as many as received him uh, to them he gave part to become sons of God the sons of God even to them that believed on his name all those who have believed on his name uh, we are also sons of God sons of of God. Look at first John chapter three. I'm reading from verse one. Be, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Which you were sons of God. He was the Son of God, and we are also sons of God. Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 8, we're reading from verse 14. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, here's the declaration of the word of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Not only that, come back to Mark. He was the son of God, and the Father affirmed that, and we too were sons of God, and the word of God has affirmed that. Number two, he was baptized in water. Baptized in water. We're looking at verse 10, chapter 1 of Mark. And straightway coming out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. As you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, what follows? You become baptized in water. Baptized in water. Mark Chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 15. Son of God, child of God, baptized in water. If you're going to be identified with Christ, you must do as he has done. He was baptized in water. You are baptized in water to that Mark. Chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Look at Matthew chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 19. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. You too must be baptized in water. He was baptized in water. You are baptized in water. Come back to Mark chapter 1 in mark chapter 1 i'm reading from verse 11 and there came a voice from heaven saying thou art my beloved son in whom i am well pleased he was the son of god we are sons of god he was baptized in water we are baptized in water and now he is called the beloved the beloved my beloved son how about the believer who are we? Look at this, Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Second Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 1. Beloved, he was, beloved are we. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, the same thing, dearly beloved, the Father loves us and we are beloved of the Father. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Beloved, I pray you'll stand to your position to be beloved in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Did I hear any amen on the floor there? Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 3 verse 14. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, you see that he was beloved, a beloved son of God, and we are beloved children of God too. Wherefore, beloved, see that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless without spot and blameless that's, that's describing christ and that's describing the beloved believer look at verse 17 ye therefore beloved ye therefore beloved seeing ye know these things before before uh, beware lest ye also be led away uh, with the arrow of the wicked for, fall from your steadfastness. You remain steadfast in Jesus' name. But grow in grace 
and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. Amen. We're coming back to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, here we're reading from verse 11. We're reading from verse 11, and there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. The father said concerning the son, his only begotten son, I am well pleased in you. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 1. It says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God. How to walk and to please God. So ye would abound more and more. Where to walk, where to please God as well. And thank God, the grace to please God, the Lord has given to you already. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. No man that worries entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him. That he may please him. We cannot say, well, that's Jesus. He pleased the Father. I'm just an honorary believer. You are sons of God, daughters of God. You have been baptized in water like he was. You are beloved like he was. And you live a well-pleasing life like he did. That he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, we're reading from verse 5. It says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had the testimony that he pleased God. He had this testimony that he pleased God. We're coming back to Mark chapter 1. I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 12. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. The Spirit led him into the wilderness. How about us today? Look at Psalm 143, verse 10. Psalm 143, and I'm reading from verse 10. In Psalm 143, here reading from verse 10, we find what happens to the believer. Psalm 143, verse 10, teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. We have the privilege here that the spirit of God will lead us. In Galatians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. Galatians chapter 5, I will read from verse 18. The spirit will lead you. The spirit will guide you. He'll lead you into victory. He'll guide you into victory. Galatians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 18. It says in verse 18, But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Led of the Spirit. The Spirit led him. And when the Spirit led him, although he was tempted, he was triumphant. And we too, we too, although we are tempted, we are going to be triumphant. You will be triumphant. Hebrews chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4. We're reading from verse 14. It says in verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, 
but he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need he'll give you grace by his grace you will overcome by his grace you'll be triumphant you will not fall keep on looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of your faith you are going to overcome in jesus name second corinthians chapter 2 second corinthians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 14 now thanks be unto god which always causes us to triumph in christ he always causes us to triumph in christ he is a forerunner he is the captain of our salvation he overcame he triumphed with you we overcome and we triumph in jesus name it says he always causes us to triumph and he maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place how did he overcome how did he triumph by the word by the word he said it is written it is written how do we overcome by the word as well the word abides in you that word will give you victory that word will ensure your victory first john chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 13 first john chapter 2 verse 13 i write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning i write unto you young men because ye have overcome the wicked one any overcomer here today god confirm it in your life in jesus name and he says i write unto you children little children because ye have known the father look at verse 14 i have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning i have written unto you young men because ye are strong because i am strong because and the word of God abides in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Did he say amen? Yeah. You are not for Jude chapter 1, verse 24. Jude chapter 1, verse 24. Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling. He's able to keep you. In every temptation, he'll keep you. Whoever the tempter temptress is, he will keep you. And whatever object of temptation, he will keep you. Say amen for yourself. Amen. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever amen. amen come to matthew chapter 4 matthew chapter 4 i'm reading from verse uh, i'm reading from verse 11 matthew chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 11 in matthew chapter 4 verse 11 and then the devil leaveth him he will leave you i said he will leave you he will not always be there. He's just there for a moment. And when you resist him, he'll flee from you in Jesus' name. Then the devil leaveth him. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. James chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 7. James chapter 4. Reading from verse 7 submit yourselves therefore unto god resist the devil what will happen and it will flee from you like he left jesus he will leave you and like angels came to jesus to minister to him angels will minister to you Amen. hebrews chapter 1 hebrews chapter 1 i'm reading from verse 13 hebrews chapter 1 verse 13 but to which of the angels said he at any time sit 
on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? Can you see the identification with Christ that who he is, that is who we are to now in this world? And because he had the victory, you will have the victory. The Father loved him, the Father loves you. The Father testified of him, the Father will testify about you. The Spirit led him, the Spirit will lead you. He was beloved, you will be beloved in Jesus' name. And though he was tempted, he triumphed. Though you are tempted, you are going to triumph. And you overcame by the word, and the word is still here. The same word, the same word. And that same word is given unto you, and angels ministered unto him. You are so special in the sight of God, angels will minister unto you. Let's rise up and pray to the Lord today and say all these words we have learned will be written upon the tables of our heart. And like Jesus had the victory, we too were going to have the victory. Brother, victory is yours. Sister, victory is yours. Open your mouth. Thank the Lord for what he has taught us and receive the grace he has given every one of us today victory triumph overcoming power is yours tonight
Oh! 